I guess it's been maybe two years ago now. Elena got a couple of toys that have been pretty significant in our interactions together and, and things around the house. She got these magnet tiles. They're these little squares and triangles that have magnets on the inside and they stick together, right? You can build all kinds of things. And around the same time, she got the magnet tiles. She also got a beach ball, right? And the beach ball, these two toys were kind of foils to each other. One is a tool of creation. You can make these beautiful structures. The other is an agent of destruction. The beach ball just causes chaos <laughs> everywhere that it goes. And one thing, I mean, for a child that age, when she was maybe just, you know, two or so, destroying is a whole lot easier than creating, <laughs> isn't it? It's a lot easier to tear something down. And so, you know, most of our initial interactions with the magnet tiles were me building things and they're seeing them immediately and mercilessly smashed, whether by beach ball or by hand or foot or whatever. And it was amazing fun, amazing fun. You know, actually we, we have put in probably hundreds of hours together building with magnet tiles. So it's become one of my favorite things, probably just as much time batting the beach ball around the house. Um, but, but as Lelena learned to grow in understanding and how to build with these tiles, they became more and more interesting to her. You know, the first challenge was just to get to be able to build anything at all that would stand up on its own. You know, so at first there were these flat structures and just making mosaics with them, they're pretty colors. But then getting that first thing she could build on her own to stand up, well, that was something special. But then, as you go, you, you learn, well, I want to build bigger, better things, like Daddy builds. So, you know, we, we would start building, and she picked up, she's a very verbal child, you know, she's picked up all kinds of advanced terminology. So even at two years old, she was talking about stabilizing. Oh, I'm stabilizing this. How can I stabilize this? I'm stabilizing, stabilizing. So we were all about stabilizing for a while. So, you know, that first challenge, just to build something that will stand up at all, is, is an interesting one. But then... When you've got the beach ball bouncing around, because very frequently when she's creating these things, she's invested in the process. Well, now I want something that won't get knocked over by the beach ball. It's upsetting. So how do you build something that'll stand up to stress? Well, God is ultimately, you know, if we bring this to a biblical perspective, God is the one that's always building, always creating something. He's creating it in his church with us today. And Satan, on the other hand, ultimately is seeking to undermine and destroy. He's the beach ball, so to speak. <laughs> If we turn to Matthew chapter 12 today to get started. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus Christ gave some teachings about the work of Satan and the work of demons as it opposes the work of God. But specifically, I want to start off with a section of scripture here in Matthew 12, 43, talking about the work of unclean spirits. Matthew 12, 43 says, When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he grows through dry places, seeking rest, and finds none. And then he says, I'll return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty and swept and put in order. And he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Now, it sounds like something we, we really want to avoid, right? So, so, so this whole thing of unclean spirits, we don't want to have any interactions with them at all if we can help it. We have this kind of surfing, surface meaning here that we take away from this. Well, if I, if I take bad things out of my life, I better put good things in. I, I don't want this unclean spirit to come back and find an empty house that it can come and dwell in and bring other spirits. That's terrible. Right? I want to be full of the way of God, full of the love of God, full of the spirit of God. But, you know, ultimately, this little verse here is not, I mean, really the, the primary intent of it is not to talk about demons and spirits. If we look at it in context, going back to verse 38, some of the scribes and Pharisees had said to Jesus, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. And he answered and said, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Okay, so they were looking for a display of Christ's power, the power of God. And Christ said, well, well, no, you're not going to get that. You know, he was already going around. He was healing people according to their faith. He was doing mighty works. He, he let the blind see and unstop the ears of the deaf. And yet they, they wanted more, or maybe they had heard those things, wanted to see it with their own eyes, but, but for display. You know, when, when they saw Jesus dying on the cross, many of those same Pharisees and scribes thought they were seeing a sign. 
Right? They thought, well, this is the sign. Now he can't even save himself. Right? The sign came a little bit later. And then many didn't believe it when it did come. Now, at Pentecost, I did give a message about the, the whole idea of signs of God's power, physical signs that these people were looking for. And we do know and understand that unclean and evil spirits, Satan, can perform signs and lying wonders. One person remarked after that sermon, actually, that if we keep looking for a sign to test God, then Satan might just come along and give us what we think is a sign from God to deceive us. So we read this in, in context here, and, and you know, they're looking for a sign. He calls them an evil and adulterous generation. Now back at the end of verse 45, where I stopped short of reading, the last state of that man is worse than the first, and so it shall also be with this wicked generation. He was still talking about that wicked generation. He was talking about this, this attitude that they had, that they, they really wanted to see a display of power from God. They didn't have a, a genuine desire for God the way that they ought to. So th this instruction, while it, it could be applied to the case, you know, it's certainly it is true about unclean spirits and how they operate in a person's life. That wasn't Jesus' primary intent. Well, what was, in fact, the unclean spirit he's referring to that the Pharisees and scribes had, that had, they had gone out from them and then came back seven times worse? Well, it's gone by a lot of different names throughout the history of the people of Israel. You could call it idolatry going back to the beginning of their relationship with God, or rebellion, or doing their own will. You can take it back to the Garden of Eden. It's defining their own sense of right and wrong. All of that was the, the spirit and the attitude. And if you want to boil it down to just one word, that word could be self. Self. They were self-willed. They were self-seeking. They were self-serving. They were self-righteous. And all of their worship even though it was dressed in a veneer of godliness, using the words of the Bible and biblical concepts, was self-centered. You know, Jesus is remarking then on how they had attempted as a people to put that out. When they returned from captivity in Babylon, which they went into because of their disobedience and all the multitude of idols and the way they had served other gods and, and all of this, they came back, they, they purged out those idols, they swept the house clean, but that God of self was still very much present, and it came back with a vengeance. So that by the time that Jesus was speaking to them, they were this wicked generation that, that had this problem of self having grown up seven times worse than it had been previously. And you know, for us, we, we see how they, they stumbled worse, seeing how they, they had tried to do good. For us, we have to worry about that too. When we come into God's way of life, I mean, do we ever become just too comfortable with where we are? Too comfortable that we're the people of God, we're called of God, we show up on the right day, we, we do all the right things? You know, do we then turn around and la allow pride and selfishness to exist in us, thinking all along, just like they did, that we're righteous? You know, the same unclean spirit of selfishness it's actually overtaking the entire world that we live in. And it's only going to grow in power and influence in the time to come. It's looking for where it can dwell. In fact, we, we also talked about how signs and lying wonders are coming at uh, the end of the age in order to sell people on this dark demonic power. Talked about that again at Pentecost. So for us personally, we need to make sure our house is full so we don't have the return of those things that we already turned away from, that God has purged out of us. Because unclean spirits do want to divide us. They want to deceive us. They want us to not be a unified, coherent structure that God is building. Not a mature and fully grown church, but a bunch of little, isolated, independent, and very selfish selves. With Pentecost just behind us, I know I keep referring to it. What did Pentecost represent? It's the founding of the church of God on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ and with the apostles laying that foundation, the pouring out of God's spirit in the beginning of something. And the next holy day to come is the Feast of Trumpets, which is also very exciting and pictures the church as this glorious bride prepared for her husband, a completed work. We're in the middle between those two holy day seasons and, and what has to happen in the middle? <laughs> between a church that is founded and a church that is fully built, there has to be some construction taking place. 
it's a good time to focus on what we're supposed to do to go on top of that foundation. So I talked at Pentecost about the, the individual level, God's spirit has to affect granting us his truth and then transforming our lives. Truth and transformation were the two main concepts. And that's very necessary for every one of us to be doing the work of. If we're not doing that, we're not doing our part. But a single person is just like one piece in the house that God is building. Just like one of those little magnet tiles. I mean, on its own, the thing can barely stand only if you balance it just right. And when it does, it's not a lot to look at. The pieces aren't fitted together. It's not going to stand up to anything. So for every one of us, when we come into the church, let's get the picture in our minds. We, we clean out our own house spiritually, right? We, we then have to keep that out as we become part of the, of the building that God is making. Our individual calling comes with a collective responsibility then to stand together. And this is going to be a problem as we come to the end times. I, I want to go through in Matthew 24 some of those prophetic warnings just so that we're aware. And we, we talked about Matthew 24 items here recently that show up in the headlines in the news today. Well, here are the things that you won't see in the headlines that we ought to be very concerned about. And it's not just the wars, it's not just the famines, it's not just the pestilences and the earthquakes in various places. What's really concerning that you don't and won't see in the headlines applies to the church of God. It's the evil spiritual influences that go on behind the scenes to corrupt people's thinking. Matthew 24, verse 9. It talks about some of these. And it's presented as key challenges to God's church in the end time. In Matthew 24, verse 9, it says, They'll deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. This is after that beginning of sorrows takes place. There, there's a transition point that's marked by the persecution of the church of God. And you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended will betray one another and will hate one another. This is an attitude shift. This is a mindset shift that's taking place. And many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Offense and betrayal in verse 10. You know, what, what exactly is behind that? You know, we live in a, a culture where People are offended all the time by everything. How much do we let that seep into our lives? And, and what's behind that? Is it not an elevated sense of self-importance and entitlement? I mean, is it not self-centeredness and pride? You know the word selfie. Everybody knows what a selfie is? You know, like that. <laughs> With the phone, you take a picture of yourself. Entered the Oxford English Dictionary just nine years ago in 2013. It was inducted into the Oxford English Dictionary. It's estimated that millennials will take an average of 25,000 selfies in their lifetime. 25,000. So if you're taking less than that in your life, somebody else has taken more than that. <laughs> Which is amazing, right? Or maybe not so amazing. People live their lives on social media. Today's headlines do talk about the breakdown of community in our nation and across the world. If technology wasn't doing enough to do that, getting us so focused on ourselves, then the pandemic was like a, a one-two punch, <laughs> right? Just that make it so we have to stay at home and just focus on ourself for a period of time. Now, not to take this too far, the Pharisees had a very bad pride problem long before there were cell phones. The technology just makes it a whole lot easier and more attractive seeming to, to judge others and, and to engage in that kind of selfishness. False prophets. Wherever there is pride, there's going to be division because every person wants to lift themselves up, which means you have a peak over here and a peak over here and different things lifted up in different places and they're, they're no longer unified. They're no longer working together. And in the midst of that, where there's pride and where there's division, there are going to be false teachers that will take advantage of that. They will prey on people's loneliness and, and their feelings of isolation. They will prey absolutely on people's pride Right? Take somebody who, who thinks that they're right about something and you start telling them what they want to hear and telling them, yeah, you are right about that and let me explain it even more. And you've got a follower, which is what we call most of our social media <laughs> things, right? You're, you're either an influencer or a follower on most social media platforms. 
We have more access to more false teachers than any time in history that will build a person up and tell them anything they want to hear, no matter how weird your personal views are. You'll, you'll find a community for it. They are preying not just on the pride and the loneliness people feel, but that human need for connection that we all feel, that God gave us. He gave us a human need for connection, and it's being systematically starved out of our whole society today. This is part why, why I think there's been such a huge upswelling with the LGBTQ stuff. It's a symptom of a nation of disconnected, deeply selfish, but also very vulnerable people who are under the influence of false prophets who come along with a message that plays directly to those weaknesses. I saw a recent Gallup poll, many of you may have seen it, that now only 81% of Americans will say they believe in God. And that's not even talking about people who go to church or, or read the Bible or do anything about it. This is just, I mean, that's a low bar, believing in God. And you're telling me almost 20% of our nation doesn't even believe in God. And for context, if you go back to 2011, it was 91%. That's a 10% decline in a decade. If you go back into the 50s and 60s, it held steady at like 98% for a long, long time. We've entered into an increasingly faithless generation. You know, very, very troubling statistic out of that. Among young adults that they polled, only 68% said that they believed in God. And that's, that's where the future on that number, that little barometer, is where it's going to go. It's going to keep going down. And, and we wonder, where is all this coming from? All these things are working together. According to the next thing listed, verse 12, lawlessness that abounds. Where does the lawlessness come from? Well, it comes from the lawless one. It comes from Satan the devil, broadcasting his evil attitude and intent. He's called in Ephesians 2.2, 2, the prince of the power of the air. And his influence is absolutely behind the moral slide and decay that we see today. Lawlessness empowers false teachers. They are happy to allow people to break any part of God's law and encourage them and celebrate them breaking it to gain a following for allegiance. Messages are all too common about doing what makes you happy, right? Setting up that God of self and really promoting that. Or do what you know is right. And all of it really is just a subtle repackaging of Satan's original deception in the garden, isn't it? Decide for yourself what's right and wrong. It's great. It's wonderful. God's rules just holding you back. The result of that way of thinking that is taking hold and prophesied, as we're reading, remember this is prophecy, that this is going to happen in society as a whole and possibly even in the church of God if we allow it to. The last symptom is that the love of many will grow cold. That's the final symptom of full-blown spiritual heart disease. When, when people stop caring about each other, and then they stop caring for each other. Stop doing the, the things that define love by God's law. Christ came at a time when all the self-righteousness of the Pharisees, all their religiosity had, had brought them to a point like that, where they neglected human needs and human compassion for the sake of their traditions that made them feel important, puffed up on pride. In the end, they, they ended up worse off than they had been even worshiping idols because really they should have known better. And they went a bad way. I mean, do we think that we're immune to all of these things because we're in the church of God? Why would we think that? I mean, yes, we have God's Holy Spirit, I'm not denying at all the power of that influence, but the Holy Spirit, we, we have to be invested in that. We have to, to be tending and nurturing and supporting God's Spirit in our lives, not just expecting it to show up and, and take over executive functions and make all the decisions for me to give me a, a good, righteous life that God wants. We have to actually be following God's outward way of love. And we're not immune to these things because we have the same increasing pressures and pulls on us that every person out there feels. You know, thankfully, God does recenter us by the knowledge of his truth, his holy days, the days of unleavened bread. Picture that. We, we go through and we, we sweep that house clean again, don't we, spiritually? We, we renew ourselves to repentance. We, we go back and we make sure that there's nothing growing in there, no pride cropping up. 
that, that needs to go from the year before. Nevertheless, even in spite of that annual reminder, which we know in practice, if we look at the Church of God, even over you know, the history of living memory, we've seen every one of the problems listed here as warnings for the end times. And so it's been, even there in the early days of the church, they had these same problems. And we know that in the end, what we're hearing from Jesus Christ in prophecy is it's going to happen again, and it might even happen to me and you if we're not prepared for it. So how do we prepare? The, the church of God is intended to stand. It's intended to stand together against these challenges. Every one of these deadly spiritual influences, and we are supposed to do it by the Spirit of God dwelling in us as individuals and when we come together collectively. Individually, we've got to receive the truth and love it. We have to live the transformation that God is trying to affect in our life. But we have to recognize also that, that the church of God can only stand if it stands together. That's the only way. Building a strong church can be a defense against everything listed here if it stands together. It can be a home base for having sound instruction, receiving God's truth, sharing it with peers. It can be an outlet for practicing and perfecting the love of God, not allowing it to grow cold, developing those loving relationships and, and fulfilling that need for human connection, even beyond just our relationship with God. We, we all do need that. God made us that way. And the church can be an anchor of support for every one of us anytime I'm struggling or you're struggling. It can provide that, and God intends it to provide that. It should be a strong church that learns and grows and serves and stands together by the will of God. To accomplish that, we have to show up here, first of all, we have to show up. And second, we have to have the mindset that we are here to be part of something bigger than ourselves. Yes, bigger than my personal relationship with God. Is being part of the bride of Christ. Bigger than my journey or your journey is what God is doing with us together. God's Spirit works in every one of us for the purpose of building up and strengthening His church. Not only our own selves. I mean, if we come committed to building up the church, we get built up too. It works. We can read about how it works. In fact, let's, let's do that. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 where Paul speaks to what is imparted by the Spirit of God, speaks to spiritual gifts, how they work among the congregation. You know, God's Spirit is something that unifies us. But, but it's almost like the, the default unification. Right? I, I get the Spirit, you get the Spirit, and now we are united in spirit. Okay, but if we don't do anything beyond that, that, that'd be a very weak kind of connection. Even though it's a connection with the Most High God, it's not fulfilling the fullness of what He desires for us. God doesn't want our unity to stop just by having the same Spirit in us. He commands us to come together for a purpose. In 1 Corinthians 14, we read about that purpose. Why does God give His Spirit to the church? He says here, pursue love. And desire spiritual gifts. Actually, it says desire the spiritual. More talking about a spiritual mindset rather than the manifestation of particular gifts. It says, especially desire that you may prophesy. Well, why would we desire that? For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. You know, the implication, the way he's talking about this is that, you know, without saying it, edifying the church is much better <laughs> than just being built up yourself. But being just built up ourselves can only take us so far. You know, like those magnet tiles, I, I can stand one up like this and it's not going to get any taller than it is. But you stick them all together and you can build amazing things. And this is what God wants us to do. We want to edify the church. Verse 5, he says, I wish you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you prophesy. You know, Paul says, I, I want the Spirit poured out on you. I want you doing all kinds of works. 
But even more that you prophesied, because he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks tongues, unless indeed he interprets. Why? That the church may receive edification. Edification just means building up. You know, he started out this section saying, pursue love. Pursue is, is such a powerful word. It's like something you run after, something you chase down and hold on to, like you're trying to catch it. And love is the, the opposite of self-seeking and self-righteousness. It's the antidote to pride. It's what makes this whole process work. Really, if we have love, we, we can't really have love or say we have love if we have it with pride. It just it doesn't compute. And you notice the things that we do by God's love? You know, we can't just sit around all by ourselves as an island and, and just love. You have to have other people. You have to have other people to build up and be built up by. Exhorting and comforting, as it says in verse 3. So Paul's instructions are clear. In fact, we, we go through this chapter in verse 12. It says, even so, since you're zealous for spiritual gifts, or again, the spiritual, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. You know, let this be your mindset. Yeah, you want to be spiritual? This is where your focus needs to be. It needs to be on building up the church. Be zealous for it. You know, this is much more important as a display of God's power. You know, the whole thing of prophesying versus speaking in tongues, the, the purpose of those gifts is much more important than any outward display of power. That's what we're being told. The real power is the connection between God's people that's being formed. Verse 24, he says again, If all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he's convinced by all, he's convicted by all, and thus the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. There are things that happen when we come together by God's Spirit that, that not one of us can cause to happen on our own. You know, the example here is, you know, what will an unbeliever think if they come in and you reveal the secrets of their heart by prophesying? Do you think you can do that? Well, sure you can. Do you know what reveals the thoughts and intents of a person's heart? Hebrews 4.12 says that's the Word of God, and you know Scripture. We can do this. There's something that happens when people connect with one another. When we stand on the word of God, when we speak the words of God, we are prophesying to others. We, we are teaching by the word of God. And it's not like if a person walks in, you have to you know, make some kind of educated guess about some broken relationship with their past and, and you know, reveal the thoughts of their heart in some mystical way. Just by speaking the word of God, the word of God has that effect, we're told. Again, that's Hebrews 4.12. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's not enough for, for me to simply come and preach a great sermon on any given week. There's something that happens among people. It's a person being convicted by all. It's about sharing life with one another. It's about the process of Christian fellowship that has the most powerful effect. We do need to have everybody prophesying. We do that by knowing and speaking the word of God. Verse 26 how is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things, you know, have those things and use those things, but let all things be done not for selfish pride, but he says for, again, edification. I think he said edification or edify like six times in this one chapter if we, if we didn't get the point. That idea of building up, I mean, this is the, the work of God in the church. If the work in an individual of the Holy Spirit is to guide them in the way of truth and to transform their life, the church is a support network that is built to help that process for every person. This whole idea of coming together and speaking the word of God, that helps every one of us support that work of truth that the Holy Spirit does individually in a person. We come to learn the truth, but also to teach the truth even through simple conversation among God's people. It involves everybody, not just the person at the lectern. The other aspect of the work of God's Spirit, transformation, 
But we get to share in one another's transformation if we can support it, if we can help somebody through a hard time, if we can provide a safe environment where people can struggle with whatever it is we, we battle with spiritually. Having the common goal of the kingdom of God and, and speak these words of comfort and encouragement to each other like it's said back in verse 3, exhortation and comfort to men. That's powerful. That's what God really wants. Paul continues later in this chapter, and he gives hints of it even in the verse that we just read about maintaining order within worship services, which is not something that our congregation really struggles with. So it's not really my purpose to talk about that so much. The, the reason they had problems with that, though, was because of the wrong attitudes that they used God's Spirit for. They were using God's spirit to build themselves up. That idea of the spiritual as something that was to edify themselves instead of having the outward focus. If we ever drift away from that, we open ourselves up to all kinds of problems just leading us charging straight ahead into the way of the world, just like the Pharisees did with their traditions. You know, just like it warns about in Matthew 24. It blinds people, having that me-first attitude. And the church won't be built up the way that it should. You'll end up with only these short little, here a little, there a little structures that, that don't amount to much. And where maybe you can build one big tall thing with no support, nothing to stabilize it, and it topples over the second something comes along that blows on it at all. Romans chapter 1. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1 and verse 11. Here's the only place in Scripture that um, the, the phrase spiritual gifts is actually used with both of those words. So uh, Paul says, I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. You might have noticed in 1 Corinthians 14 where we saw that phrase spiritual gift or spiritual gifts, that gift was always in italics. Uh, that, that's because it was only the word spiritual that was there. In other places, only the word gift that was there. But here's the only place where we find spiritual gifts put there as a, a continuous phrase in Greek. At least the only one I know of. I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. What is Paul telling these people? If we think about it. First of all, he says, I long to see you. This establishes what, what we all know by now. That the church of God needs face-to-face -face interaction to operate effectively. It's just as true in the age of social media as it was in the time of Paul. He could write them letters and communicate that way, and he was doing that. It was the best he could do at that time, but they all knew it was no substitute for face-to-face -face interaction, that more could be done if they could see each other in person. But what about when he says, I, I want to impart to you some spiritual gift that you may be established? How do, how do we take that part? I mean, does it sound like Paul's purpose was to show up and just put his gifts on display and work miracles and you know, heal a few people over here, speak in a tongue over there, that people can really have some faith because now they've seen the sign? Well, hopefully we, we established earlier that that's just not how God operates. He didn't do that with Christ and the Pharisees. He wasn't going to do that with the church. That was never the purpose of any display of God's power in the New Testament. Does it sound like he was going to go there and imbue them with physical manifestations of the Spirit? Like, okay, here comes Paul. I mean, we're, we're baptized. We've got the Spirit in us. But the power's got to be unlocked so that now I can receive to speak in tongues and, and do this, that, and the other. Well, <laughs> they, they already had the Spirit of God. Why, there, there's nothing in the Bible that indicates that it works like this ever, that a person comes along and, and has to unleash the, the spirit within you or something like that. No. Paul explains himself in verse 12. He tells us what this is about. First of all, we see it was so that you may be established. The purpose was going to be building up the church, edifying, just like we saw in 1 Corinthians 14. But he explains, he says, that is that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith of both you and me. So you mean to tell me that Paul... The Apostle Paul, who had directly seen Jesus in visions, who had experienced all these amazing things, this amazing transformation, who might think of as maybe one of the, the strongest people of Christian faith that ever lived, 
that he was going to be encouraged by coming and talking to some folks in Rome, just average, you know, people there following along that, that weren't ministers, that weren't some great paragon of faith? Well, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And he didn't see a disparity like that, like anybody might say, because there's not. Christian fellowship, he's saying, is a process of give and take. That, that it's never God just having you know, weak members coming to feed off of the strong and the strong showing up to present all their power and all their gifts and all these other things. No, it's a mutual process. You know, Paul, as he came to speak to them, to teach them further in the faith, the faith was also going to be edified in that process. And it has to be so. You can only build up if you're building together. I actually get to experience this all the time in the course of my work as a pastor. You know, I, I get to speak with people who are new in the faith that are, you know, you know j just like Paul did. I, I try to remember to point out just seeing the examples of how God is working with them, how God is leading them along in the truth, especially those that have gone through baptism counseling with me. It's uplifting and exciting to see people who have the first love that it speaks about in Revelation 2. To, to see people who are just excited and on fire for the word of God. Not that those who have been around longer aren't. Because I learned a lot from them too. Especially people who have been following God for a very long time. Over the course of a lifetime. You know, longer than I've been alive. And they've been doing it faithfully. And they're, they're powerful in prayer and powerful in service. And have been steadfast through all kinds of trials. That I haven't endured anything like. And for the other folks who are in the middle like me. <laughs> I learned from you all, too. And we're, we're in this together. I'm encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Something that I like to do, when I figured out I like to do this every year about this time after Pentecost, is give a little bit of a report to each congregation on, on the year, sort of a state of the congregation address. Uh, as I've called it that in my, <laughs> in my head. <laughs> How are we doing here in Northern Virginia as a congregation? And, and what's it been like the last year? Well, I, I think if we take our minds back to a year ago after Pentecost last year, we were all feeling very hopeful about the Feast of Tabernacles in 2021. We all thought, this is it. You know, we, we get back to having a real feast without all the restrictions and, and all the stuff, without having to really worry about COVID the same way we did last year. And so, so we kind of charged ahead into that. And it just, yes, we had a good time while we were there, but afterwards, it was heart-wrenching. I mean, we, we really had to come face-to-face -face with a lot of sickness, a lot of people hospitalized, even a couple in our own congregations here, in our own area, and those that died. And we had to take a couple of weeks off after the feast from coming together because so many people were sick, we, we didn't have enough people to come together. And I think that was really disappointing. You know, after that, there was this massive surge of the Omicron variant and you know, more restrictions that kind of came down and got in the way of things. In February, I, I started to feel a turning point. I don't, I don't know about you, but I have documentation of it. You know, one thing that I do as a pastor, I send in monthly reports to the home office. Don't let that scare you. <laughs> you know, they're pretty basic stuff. How many people were there? Who spoke? What was the message about? Um, you know, even just the, the title is enough for that. Were there any activities or events? Basic stuff. Anybody baptized? Just a, a report, a report. And there is room for personal comments. And sometimes I, I do give a little bit more beyond just the, the basic facts of what took place each month. Here's what I wrote the first week of March when February had just closed. I turned in the February report for our congregations here. Another action-packed month in the books. Here's one comment that's not in the reports. We seem to have gained a lot of energy and enthusiasm that had waned after the post-feast illnesses and difficult winter COVID wave. Attendance is back up. The fellowship has been almost deafeningly loud most weeks. We almost have to kick people out of the door at the end, which is the way it should be. There's still a lot of individuals and all of our congregations going through trials, but I see so much love and community and support shared among the brethren here. 
And that was in March, and we've had about three months since then. And we've had a lot of wonderful things even since then. I, I mean, we, we came together as a congregation here in Northern Virginia to preach the gospel with our seminars. You know, even those didn't turn out with as big of a response as we would have liked. But we had such a great time. It was a joy to come and work together, to share together, to learn together, to serve together, to plan together. We were, we were rejoicing. We were fulfilling the, the, the fellowship that we read about, that Paul encouraged people in times past to have. And we, we gained a certain amount of momentum through that that has just been amazing, amazing to watch. And you know, we come into the summer months and we're all, we still keep a lot of momentum, but it gets diverted elsewhere, right? We've got kids in, in camps all over the U.S. and all kinds of personal travel and different things that we're doing. But it really feels like we have, we have reached a, a certain point of cooperation together that resulted from the foundation of love and support for one another that we've been building here for a number of years that's coming to fruition. And it's exciting, and it's encouraging. And I, I'm excited to see what we're going to build next. You know, anything that we build, I think it's, it's clear that wh whatever we build it isn't going to come from just one person standing alone to establish and do some great work. It's got to be the way that all the things we've had success at have worked. It's by doing it together. So every one of us, I think, can reflect in the coming weeks and months and even over the next year until my next State of the Congregation address and think, you know, am I really honing the fundamentals? Am I coming to edify others with whatever abilities and talents and gifts and energy that God has given me by His Spirit? Am I using it to build up the church? Or... Uh, am I feeling like I've, I've got a lot of potential locked in here that I, I'm not really acting on or fulfilling? You know, how, how can I give more in our local congregation and to the church as a whole, where, wherever we might be? Also on the fundamentals list, am I committed to not just knowing the people here, but caring about them as brethren? Showing care for them. Am I fighting to, to have and maintain community within our congregation, despite the usual challenges of distance and a world that expects more and more from us in our jobs and in every facet of life? Am I fighting for that community? I want to tell you a little bit more about the magnet tiles. You know, after, uh, I think I mentioned hundreds of hours of playing with the things together, probably mine and Lelena's favorite activity to do together. We experimented with all kinds of different structures and one day, I just had the thought, how strong of a structure can we build? How strong can it be with just these little magnetic connections? You can pull them apart, easy as that. Okay, so came up with a design, started building. And after a couple of iterations, I came up with a design that felt pretty solid. So I went ahead and made it, made it bigger, right? Built on that design. And, and I had a pretty solid tower. So I said, all right, Lena, where's your beach ball? And she took it and she threw it. And maybe one little magnet tile flipped off the top that was kind of loose, and the rest of it stayed completely intact. So when she gets a challenge like that, she gets pretty determined. I don't know if you know that about her. So <laughs> she got the beach ball and hurls it as hard as she can. And this time, nothing moves on this whole edifice. So I thought, okay, well, that's pretty good, how, but how far does it go? So I take the beach ball and I hurl it. I mean, I slam the thing. I'm convinced that I threw it about as hard as anybody can throw a beach ball. There is a physical limit with wind resistance and all that. I'm pretty sure I hit the terminal velocity of that beach ball, and not a thing moved. So I called Danielle in, and, and I said, you know, she didn't know what we were up to. Throw this beach ball as hard as you can at this building. And she fully expected it to crash down, and, and of course, again, nothing moved because... Obviously, I threw it harder than my wife. Come on. <laughs> She's a more skilled pitcher than me, so I'll give her that. Well, my daughter, not to be deterred, takes another crack at it. And she comes up and she steps onto the building. And it stood. And she stands on top of it. 
And uh, okay, come on, they're magnet tiles. It, it wobbles a little bit. I, I mean, once you get off center, the things don't have any kind of foundation in them. So it all collapsed. It all collapsed eventually. But, but, I mean, what was the key to my design that day? I, I made as much of a highly interconnected internal structure as I could. Every place that you could put a magnet tile inside, you put a magnet tile. Every connection you can make, you make. And the result turned out to be incredibly strong. I mean, much stronger than I would have given these things credit for. So even though these little toys have limits, the bonds that you and I are making are by the Spirit of God. And what is the limit to the strength of the love of God between us by His Spirit? It doesn't have limits as far as I know. The Church of God is as strong as our mutual faith in Jesus Christ is when we come together. If we're encouraging and strengthening one another, we, we can make more and more of those connections and make them stronger. You know, the foundation of Jesus Christ and the apostles, that's, that's sealed, that's eternally solid, not going anywhere. But what's built on top has to be joined and fit together. God's Spirit has to interconnect us, not just one here to another there, sparsely. There has to be a highly interconnected web of love and support and encouragement so that this building that we have here can stand. Turn with me back to Matthew chapter 12, verse 46. Just after where we started out, that parable of the unclean spirit that goes out and the seven more wicked that come back in. You know, just after Jesus Christ had told them about their real problem of pride through this parable, even though they wouldn't understand it at that time, he found occasion to teach them about how to be different. And it teaches us too. Verse 46 in Matthew 12, While he was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him. And one said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But he answered and said to the one who told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and he said, These here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. What Christ pointed them to was exactly what we've been talking about today. The proper use of God's Spirit is to connect with one another with the love of family, as a church family, that God is building and creating. So e even now, in, in the headlines, prophecy seems to be coming to pass in various ways, and that can be troubling. If we're not diligent about building up God's church, what's well, going to be a lot more personally troubling will be the cracks in, in our building if we haven't built it strong. I mean, when that comes to pass, if, if we have the love of many right here in this congregation grow cold in the end times, that, that'd be a lot worse than, than any war that I could think of. We, do, we don't want that to happen. We have to really be living by the Spirit of God, and if we're doing that, it's got to show up not just in our personal life, it's got to show up in our congregation. And I believe that it is, and we need to continue that together. We have to continue showing up every Sabbath and every Holy Day with that mutual encouragement, supporting one another, guiding each other in truth, and helping one another in that work of transformation. We're all trying to be better, to be more like God and like Jesus Christ. So we have to keep the unclean spirit of self far away from our own mindset and attitude and not bring it in among God's people. If we do that, we'll continue creating a stable and resilient building one that will help us stand up against all the evil influences and workings of Satan the devil and his demons in the world today that we, we know is going to overtake all of society in the last days. We can only do this, which is the will and the commandment of God that we love one another if we abide in his perfect love by his spirit together.